Okay, we roll through all the presentations. Uh, so if you are interested today, reach out to any of the officers here. <coughs> we uh, get your name and and your company logo and your slides up on the slides, and, and then you will keep go keep keep rolling during the social hours and during the presentations. And uh, lastly, uh, we also looking for volunteers for student outreach. I think in February, city of Minneapolis looking for another engineers or another firm to uh, present at the University of Minnesota ASCE. And we also try to reach out to MSU and also Minnesota to do. If you are interested to help NGS, uh, reach out to any officers and uh, we'd, be, we'd be happy to happy to help us out. Um, and <coughs> yeah, we, of course, we give you another round of applause. <laughs> Okay. Okay. So Chad, PE, PG, DTE is a principal engineer, engineering partner in Nationals in Minneapolis, Minnesota office. Engineering partner is specially consulting engineering firm practicing in the area of circuit tension. Foundation underpinning and specialty deep foundation design. Mr. Underwood has two degrees and has three in certificate engineering from the University of Wisconsin Medical, with 20 years of technical design and project management experience in regional and national engineering schools. He is also a board certified certificate engineer by the Academy of Technology, the DGE. And you need an interview to get one. Right? Oh, thank you, Chad. All right, thank you. <coughs> Is this a little blurry or not? A little blurry. You know which one's the focus? <laughs> I don't want to mess up your. Uh... <coughs> oh, I think... It's like a game of Jenga going on up here with that projector. <laughs> a little bit. Can, it, can, can everyone see this clearly? Or... Yeah, that's good. Okay. okay. All right, thanks, Lang. Uh, everyone hear me back there pretty good? All right, yeah. pretty uh, pretty small room, so this is uh, this is kind of nice. It's cozy. I like it. I like it. The wallpaper. <laughs> for, those, for those of you guys who aren't here, you're missing out. This is a special place. Um, I like my grandparents' basement. <laughs> um, so anyway. Um, I'm here to talk about uh, slope stabilization, mainly using tiles and tieback anchors. Uh, mostly going to be talking through some case histories. Uh, I'll go a little bit into uh, just some very general kind of design intro stuff. Um, but the three case histories are: <clears throat> there's one uh, railroad embankment up uh, near Duluth that I'll talk about. Um, the roadway reconstruction near Taylor's Falls, which was kind of an, emer an emergency repair <laughs> that ended up need needing to happen during that project. And then a, a landslide in Bismarck. And so the bulk of the time we'll be talking about the, uh, the case history. So um, piles and tiebacks for slope stabilization. Obviously there's, there's a lot of other ways to stabilize slopes. I'm not going to kind of go through all the different options for now, but <clears throat> focusing on piles and tiebacks. Um, as you can imagine, when you install piles through either a, say, an active landslide, something that's failed already, or, um, or you're trying to prevent some global failure, the, the piles act kind of as a Kind of a shear pins and increase the shearing resistance along that along that failure plane. Um, <clears throat> so tieback anchors similarly they can increase the shear resistance along the failure plane by by increasing normal and tangential stresses along that plane. They, they can also decrease the driving stress because you're pre-tensioning the tiebacks and you're kind of Kind of removing some of that driving stress that's wanting that uh, wanting to move that that soil mass down the slope. <clears throat> so, the kind of the general design process or iteration is basically to compute how much pile resistance you're going to get 
um, acting as that shear key across the across the, the failure plane or the slip plane. Um, you know, then checking bending stresses in the pile to make sure you're not exceeding uh, you know, pile bending capacities and so forth. Um, in certain soil, in certain soil conditions, you can actually get soil that will want to flow between the piles. So it's kind of balancing, you know, pile spacing to, you know, what how the soil is going to behave uh, as it's trying to move down the slope. Uh, and then, of course, when you introduce tieback anchors, it's just checking structural and geotechnical capacity of tieback anchors to make sure we've got enough pull-out resistance that tieback anchor is extending far enough beyond the failure plane so that um, so that the whole system doesn't want to go for a ride all together. That tieback anchor has got to be bonded well beyond that uh, that failure surface. Um, <clears throat> one of the one of the misconceptions I think when a lot of people think of piles in slope stabilization um, and, and you're trying to mobilize the shear resistance of the pile, well, you never really mobilize the full structural shear resistance of a steel pile. So for, for example, like a uh, HP 14 by 73 pile, if it's driven through a failure plane, it's got <clears throat> say, 20 square inches of, of cross-sectional area, 50 KSI steel, that's, you know, 20 or 1,000 kips or something times a half, say, for allowable, 500 kips of shear resistance we should get out of one pile. Well, that's not necessarily the case because we're, <clears throat> we're limited by the, the soils. The soil is going to give before before you can mobilize that much shear resistance or or the pile is going to be bending so much that the bending stresses are going to be exceeded. So so a lot of people when they think of they think of using steel piles for for slope stabilization, you, you think of almost you could get infinite strength out of it, but that's just not not the case. I'm not going to go too much into that, but um, just wanted to comment on that. Um, <clears throat> so most commercial Slope stability software packages now include some kind of reinforcement option where you can, you can <clears throat> analyze your, your reinforcing elements, whether it's piles or tiebacks or soil nails or, or whatever. Um, but, but the other thing to, to note that it's, it's important to, to really understand how the software program that you're using, how, how, how it uses that data, how is it treating the, the reinforcement um, you know, there's some some cases where the the reinforcement is is acting to to reduce the the driving stress, the driving forces, and there's some some reinforcements or some software that that it increases the sh the uh, shearing resistance. So, depending on depending on how the software handles that. Might depend on whether you use, and when you're looking at your structural capacity of your reinforcing element, whether you're using allowable or ultimate. Again, I'm not going to go too much into that, but for some of those of you who may have played with this a little bit or or may be getting into looking at this stuff, it's just, just one of those things to keep in mind that um, that understanding your your software, what you're putting in, so you know what you're getting out. Um, so I'm going to get right into the case histories, tend to be the little more interesting parts of it. But uh, so the first one is uh, CN Steelton project up near Duluth. Uh, this was um, the we were working for the the specialty contractor, which was Terra Engineering and Construction out of Madison for this project. Uh, the project engineer was Golder Associates. So this particular stretch of rail had a pretty long history of, of some issues. Uh, 1997, a partial slope failure. And of course, like with a lot of these slope issues, there's, there's some history. And it seems like every time there's an initial slope failure, the first response is to fill it with garbage and chunks of debris and concrete and just get it back to where it was which is great for 
for now, you know. Um, but when you got to come back later and try to then do something with that, it makes it a lot more difficult. So, um, you know, 2002, there was some additional um, monitoring that in physiometers that were indicating some elevated pore pressures. So uh, they put in some finger drains to try to relieve some, some of that pore pressures from the slope. And our involvement came in 2014 when um, I believe that the, the rail, they were expanding the rail line, adding another, another line or something. So they were gonna be building out that embankment onto an already unstable slope. So uh, that's where they came in and wanted to do the uh, soldier pile wall, anchored soldier pile, <clears throat> pile wall to stabilize that slope um, to accommodate the new, the new rail construction. So this is uh, kind of a, depicts the, the failure area, the tracks kind of running up there. So the stratigraphy of this part of Duluth, there's, this depicts kind of the, the proposed condition with the new embankment fill overlying some existing uncontrolled fill. And then we had some kind of primarily fat clay overlying silty sand, denser silty sand material and then bedrock. And you notice by this image here, everything's kind of sloping off down slope. So, um, so that just, you can see why this was gonna be a problem. You got all these weaker clay layers. And if, especially if you've got some elevated pore water pressures, um, you can see pretty, pretty easily how that whole thing might wanna go downhill. Um, there was some instrumentation on the project that had fairly well defined this, this failure plane. Um, so the, the project engineer, which again, which was Golder, had specified this uh, soldier pile wall as the primary stabilization method. Um, so like I talked a little bit about in the intro, we're basically combining some deep foundation that's that's kind of cutting through that shear plane, increasing shear resistance and tie backs that are both increasing shear resistance and in a sense, decreasing driving forces, <clears throat> all of which is gonna increase the safety factor for, uh, for slope stability. So the soldier pile wall was being constructed 50 feet from the center line of the existing track. So you can see here, um, 50 feet is pretty close. I mean, that's, when you're, I don't know, you're working down there and you're looking up and the trains are rolling by and you can feel the, <clears throat> feel the vibrations. That's 50 feet is pretty close. Um, so the wall itself was 208 feet long. Uh, piles are HP 14 by, 14 by 73s, eight feet on center. Um, average drove up 60 feet. Um, there's treated, Timber, so we called it a anchored soldier pile wall, but the, at the end of the day, there was nothing, nothing exposed. It was all buried, but in order to excavate down to an elevation where the tie back anchors were gonna be installed, that installed some timber lagging, which got abandoned in place. And so <clears throat> everything got buried. So there was nothing exposed at the end of the day. Um, tie back anchors were pretty high capacity, 280, up to 280 kips either four or eight strand uh, anchors, all with double corrosion protection. Um, so the general construction sequence was to come in, a contractor kind of built a working platform for the drill rig, installed the H piles uh, by drilling 36 inch diameter holes, setting the piles, filling with concrete, or com it was a combination of concrete and CLSM, concrete at the bottom for like the bottom, uh, 10 feet or something like that, and then CLSM the rest of the way. <clears throat> and then, like I said, they excavate from this level down, install timber lagging down to where they're gonna install the, the tieback anchors uh, and install the tieback anchors uh, using an eight inch diameter drill hole. Um, and then, like I said, everything got back filled and we'd never know anything was there. Um, so, Jumping ahead to construction, you can see some of the soldier piles uh, starting to be installed. Um, 
in the drill rig here. That is not the drill rig that put in the piles. Really? <laughs> <laughs> so after the first four piles were installed, they found that the bedrock dropped significantly deeper than was expected. Shocking, right? Right. <laughs> Anytime you do something, you think you got it figured out, and and lo and behold, it's not like you think it is. So, um, so AET, that's an AET drill rig. They came out, drilled a bunch more borings, kind of got things figured out, what was going on, and I think part of part of the challenge with the or at least my, I'm guessing part of the challenge with the initial site characterization was this, this was all a slope that was probably difficult to get, get equipment on to do soil borings in, in certain locations. So, um, but the additional uh, geotechnical exploration actually found that it might be kind of hard to see here, but this green lines are kind of the initial expectation of where bedrock was going to be encountered. And then the, the blue lines are kind of ending where bedrock actually ended up being after the additional exploration. So obviously contractors already out there with piles that are X feet long, and now they got to go X plus Y feet long. They've got tieback anchors. So not only, do, not only does that affect the piles, but as we go back, the bedrock, even back where the tieback anchors go, ended up being deeper. So then tieback anchors gotta be longer. So it was a it was a mad scramble to say the least to try to one update the design, resubmit the design, get the design reviewed for approved, get more materials procured. So um, very hectic just given the fact that the contractor is already out there mobilized with a plan to move forward and uh, quickly had to go to, to plan B. So makes, it's fun to think about now, but at the time, <laughs> you know, probably not. But so this is just a, just an image of the, of the pile layout, just a straight, straight wall. Um, like I said, the part of the slope was filled with concrete debris and stuff to try to stabilize things. So actually didn't end up being too big of a problem for drilling. Um, and then all these dash lines, these are the finger drains that were put in uh, approximately, you know, and, you know, the first thing they said, well, you know, you can try not to hit the finger drains when you're, <laughs> when you're drilling the piles and it's like, you know, it, Sorry, but there's probably pretty much no chance those are going to survive. So, <laughs> so that realization actually kind of factored into the design, which uh, you, you kind of see in this elevation view, approximately where they thought all these finger drains were. And, and these piles aren't even shown to their three foot drill hole diameter, which takes away even more, <clears throat> more space in between there. Um, but what it what it did is we had to we had to look at the, the stabilization in, in a couple of different ways. One with kind of the current groundwater elevation scenario, and then one with, well, we just destroyed your, all your finger drains. Now let's assume the pore water pressures go back up to where they were before the finger drains, make sure we still have adequate safety factors. So um, but this a couple couple sections going through here just to show <clears throat> at different locations along the wall. Um, not only does is bedrock changing, you know, as we go down the slope, but even just along the wall, it's it's diving down. So these conditions are changing pretty rapidly in a relatively small area. Um, there's another one too. So like I said, we ended up having to look at several different conditions, um, mainly focusing on the different groundwater conditions, either the, um, the depressed condition that was uh, with the finger drains or elevated. And so we had different target safety factors that we were trying to 
try, trying to hit with, with each one of those. So um, looking at the, the condition where we've got the new railroad embankment with rail surcharge loading, elevated pour water pressures, you know, we had a safety factor less than one. So that was no good. So what we were trying to shoot for was a safety factor 1.2 with this higher groundwater condition. Um, so that was the basis for determining, you know, how much pile shear resistance do we need? How much anchor resistance do we need? And then it kind of backs into our stabilization design from there. Um, you know, ultimately, um, basically getting getting to uh, what once we could do a back analysis to determine how much anchor force we would need. We could we could uh, plug that in and figure out then what our what our safety factors were. And, and again, the, the conditions changed so much along the length of the wall. It was only a 200 foot long wall, but um, we had to look like look at <clears throat> three different sections to kind of kind of make sure we were capturing uh, the conditions or representing the conditions along the wall as they changed. Um, so here's shot during uh, construction, drilling tieback anchors. These were uh, fabricated sleeves through the pile, so there was no external whaler or anything like that. Um, ended up having to be a pretty heavily reinforced steel section at the top. Just like I said, the anchor loads were 280 kips, so um, that's a lot of load um, for uh, for that that anchor head connection. Um, another image of some uh, stressing of the anchors. You can see here, these are the, the bearing plates and, and trumpets for the bearing plates were like, I can't, like two and a half, three inches thick or something. I mean, they're, they're beefy, everything was, everything was big. Um, so that was CN Steelton, that was a railroad project. The next one is um, Highway 8 reconstruction up uh, near Taylor's Falls. And this was a project that was under construction. We had nothing to do with our, our contractor uh, friends, uh, Terra Engineering and Construction again, were on the project doing other stuff. Um, then in the middle of the project, there was some heavy rains and, and resulted in a couple pretty significant slope failures. And we're talking like right on the bluff of the St. Croix River. Um, so very environmentally sensitive area. And you know anything about the St. Croix River, you, you just don't, you don't put stuff in it. So, um, so it was important to, to get these stabilized quickly, um, not only for the, for the sake of the project schedule, but for keep people happy with who like the St. Croix River. So, um, so the so the slope slope, fail, slope failures occurred, um, and there were two two big sites. I'm only going to talk about site one, <laughs> site two, site one used we used again piles and tieback. Site two uh, utilized soil nails and shotcrete. So a little different type of method. I'm not going to talk about, but um, so this is site one looking downhill after the after the failure and just temporarily contractor temporarily put some plastic sheeting over the slope just to kind of prevent some additional uh, washout and so forth with rain. Um, but what was a pretty steep slope to begin with just was made steeper and had a steeper head, head scarf after the failure. So um, the Chad, is this, this um, upslope or downslope from the road? Oh, sorry, this is downslope from the road. Yep, yep. So, so the Highway 8 runs here, slope goes down, St. Croix River's down mm -hmm. here, and then the, mm -hmm. a, the slope goes up from there, too. Um, so, and I should know that this, during this time, the the highway was closed, the roadway was closed because they were doing other work on it. So there was no danger to the public or anything like that. It was it was just construction, big construction zone. Um, 
So you, it's kind of hard to see in here, but the the wall sits right along here, basically right times out right at the top of that headscarf of that failure. In in the the wall had to be there because the lanes of traffic were like right next to that. So we had to. Um, so one of the one of the biggest issues was how are we going to get equipment right on the edge of this headscarf that's pretty precarious to be even walking up to and looking over, let alone drive a drill rig up to it. So um, a lot of that ended up controlling how we approached the design, was just how to safely get equipment in there. Um, but anyway, yeah, like I said, 102 foot long wall, HP 14 by 73 piles, uh, an eight foot six on center, CLSM backfill. This one, unlike the last one, which the wall ended up getting completely buried and you didn't see it, <clears throat> this wall actually did have some exposure um, just because to, to try to fill this in, to try to fill this in and reestablish that grade, I mean, they'd be dumping rock over there for, you know, forever because it just keep, it just keep falling down, <clears throat> keep running down the slope and there's just no way to stop it. So, so this, this wall did have some exposure and, and so we designed it with precast concrete lagging that was then I think stained or painted or something to, so if you happen to be on the Wisconsin side of the river looking over and you saw something over there, it didn't look like gray concrete, it looked like tan concrete. <laughs> so <laughs> someone was happy with that. Um, so the tieback anchors on this one are uh, inch and three quarter inch, or inch and three quarter diameter, grade 150 all thread bar. Again, double corrosion protection. Um, here's a here's a section through here. Again, this is this is kind of the, the failure surface. Um, that again, like I mentioned, that the wall needed to be pretty much right at the top of that failure scarp because. The traffic barrier needed to be right behind that, and then the lanes of lanes of traffic uh, behind that. So, so to get this wall in, the contractor temporarily excavated down uh, part way to create a bench in order to drill and install those piles. But the problem was we couldn't get a in order to drill the tieback anchors. You know, typically be on the downslope side of the wall. Um, you couldn't get a bench on the downslope side because it would be unstable and and slide down the slope like the rest of the stuff. So, so what we did is we we used a dead man and we anchored the dead man. So rather than anchoring the retaining wall directly, we just shot over horizontally with a threaded rod to another set of piles that were installed back away from the slope. And so we had plenty of room to drill the tieback anchors safely back there. So as the retaining wall wanted to push or pull, you know, rotate down towards the slope, down slope, they would pull on the tie rod, which would then engage that tieback anchor. So not a very conventional design, but it had to be done to basically just to safely get the tieback anchors in. So um, again, uh, kind of a sleeved anchor head connection, reinforced similar to the last one. Um, here's a <coughs> photo kind of during construction and kind of, kind of see what I mean. They're, they were able to excavate down part way to install the piles closest to the failure. Well, install both both lines of piles, but then uh, they could sit sit right in between there uh, and drill the tiebacks, uh, do the rest of the work. So, so, with the dead man connection like that, does that allow you to shorten your tieback because it's not within the failure plan of the slope, or is it really not affect the length of the tieback? Yeah, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> yep. In this case, that would be true. You would. You could, relative to the front wall, 
you could shorten that up. So if you were to install the front front wall, it'd have to be longer yep. than it would be at the back wall. In this case, these acres were all being bonded into rock, so it probably not as much of a difference because uh, we were just trying to hit hit the rock. But but that that is that is true. Yep. Yep. Like I guess you're you're taking questions along the way as well. Yeah. I I mentioned that in that I remember this is this is happening, but refresh my what were we doing? What was what were we doing with highway? Because this became an emergency situation. Yeah. And I really know because it became an emergency so playing and then we were emergency mode. But anyway, yeah. What, what was what were we actually doing that then was it just weather related or what what were we doing? I think the original project was some I'm not positive, but I think it there was there was some um, some minor slope stabilization that was happening further uphill um, and some uh, I think resurfacing. Uh, and I, I think that was I think that was it. That was. Well, yeah, that's kind of why I don't want to get too far into this. And if you don't, I don't, you know, you don't know what I, it, it seemed like it was a relatively simple project, but the area was high risk. Yeah. And so that, anyway, but we, you know, maybe yeah. some of this should have been, should have been anticipated, but it wasn't. And then we end up in this, but anyway, keep going. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but no, from, from what I understood about it, it was, it was a pretty routine project up until, until this. And then, Yes. And then, yeah. So, um, so yeah. Again, it, it was uh, it was a quick it was a quick turnaround. So we we get the first phone call in May of 2019, um, and we had our design completed in June, and then that includes. I mean, and again, during this during this time, we are um, we're working. I mean, we're working pretty pretty closely with MnDOT and they're doing some internal reviews and kind of along the way and making sure everyone's comfortable with it. So by the time we got to the end, we were pretty, everyone was pretty comfortable with what what we were doing. So um, you normally don't have get something to happen that fast. I mean, that, that was really pretty fast. So then pile installation began in September after procuring materials and, and whatnot. And then everything was done in October I and I don't know about the original schedule when when the original project was supposed to be done or how it affected um, schedule and stuff I'm not sure about that but at least our part of it went pretty quick so. <laughs> <clears throat> um, and I mentioned you, you can kind of see the the river down there so <clears throat> the aesthetics of this what was an important consideration and what the what the thing looked like at the end. So um some picture this is the dead man wall, picture of the dead man wall, the tie back anchors uh, being installed. Um it's kind of the sleeve for the tie the horizontal tie rods that went back to the dead man. Um so that I mean nothing uh nothing too out of the ordinary of the type of system that was used with the piles and anchors, just a little bit different implementation of it just to deal with the, um, the that site specific condition. Um, so the last one is the University of Mary on uh, Bismarck, North Dakota. Um, this was uh, the project engineer was Wank Associates, the contractor. So we, for this project, we worked for Wank and then the contractor was Keller. I still, I still like to call him Hayward Baker, but there's Keller now. So um, I don't think there's anyone here. You're good. All right. <laughs> Don't put everyone. All right. Well, too bad they're not here. I could have had them uh, buy a happy <laughs> Anyway, so this was, we were not involved in the kind of the investigation stage of all this, but there was a series of landslides along the 
river here, and I'm trying to remember the river. <clears throat> it's not the Missouri, it's, some, it's a river that feeds into the Missouri. Um, I'm drawing a blank on it, but whatever. This river, you know, it's got some, you know, cut banks, and as that those cut banks come in, you know, there's it's eroding and slope is in certain areas wanting to slide down towards the river. Nothing that anyone probably hasn't heard before. So, um, so we were brought in to look at one particular area, and this was closest to a dormitory. So. They kind of got elevated on the priority list for obvious reasons. Um, the rest of these were a little bit further away from civilization. So um, here's a topo kind of you can see the, the dormitory up here. You can pretty clearly see the failure start uh, in the topo lines. Uh, so the <clears throat> our Stabilization wall will end up being somewhere in here, as we'll see in a little bit. But um, soil conditions actually pretty good. I mean, some loose, loose-ish sand up at the top. There was some, uh, but then we got into some really pretty stiff clay. There were some lignite layers and and so forth um, that that were likely the probably the contributors to, to this slip plane developing. Uh, that along with, again, elevated pore water pressures. Uh, and again, we weren't, we weren't involved in the investigation phase of this or the um, determining the cause of the, the uh, landslides, but, um, but you know, from my understanding, uh, elevated pore water pressures along with these weak, thin, weak layers in the, in the soil profile. Uh, but again, this one was pretty well instrumented. We had a very defined upper and lower kind of failure plane uh, through in, uh, inclinometers. Um, so we had inclinometers down low and up high and, <clears throat> and had a pretty pretty good feel for where that, that failure plane was. So uh, again, running stability analyses, again, keying in on groundwater levels of, you know, depressed and elevated, and making sure we've got safety factors that are appropriate for, for each condition. Uh, so this wall, a little longer, a little over 700 feet long. Uh, it's kind of hard to see, but kind of reddish line through here. <clears throat> so that was, so the wall, again, piles, tieback anchors, that was to address this more deep-seated failure plane. But we also had to, if you remember, there's that pretty pronounced head scarp in there, which was fairly steep. So not only did we have to make sure we were stabilizing the, the existing slip plane, but we had to stabilize that head scarp too and the best way to do that was to regrade it so, so we could get it at a constant slope, like a three to one slope. <clears throat> the only problem with, with that is that it to bring in a bunch of fill, which is then adding more driving stress to the unstable soil mass that we're trying to, trying to stabilize. So, so that significantly factored into the design. Um, Ideally, if the dormitory wasn't there, instead of adding fill to shallow up that slope, they would have excavated it and regraded it that way. But um, that's what we have to deal with. So, so you can kind of see here the, the original failure slope in a section view, and then the, the new fill that was placed um, after the piles were installed. So. Pretty long piles. Uh, again, these are installed in 36 inch diameter drill holes, uh, up to 70 feet long. Tieback anchors were quite long, 110 feet predominantly. Um, again, pretty high capacity, 233 kip, uh, eight strand anchors. Uh, so the this one 
also had an actual exposed wall. They were going to redo this area down <clears throat> towards the river for, um, uh, you know, walk, make walking paths in the park and whatever else. So there's a, some of this wall was exposed. We did, a, uh, this was a reinforced concrete facing uh, that we designed for this wall. Um, one thing to note, so you can see the tieback anchors were installed at this working grade elevation down here, <clears throat> but we couldn't, we couldn't pre-stress the tiebacks until we put all this fill in because we're going we're to try to stress these tieback anchors to 233 kips plus the test load. So if we didn't have any backfill behind there to for the soil to resist that anchor for us, we would have bent those piles over. So they, again, another trick to the analysis and design was to check this, you know, can we put the piles in, load this landslide with all this soil before tensioning the tieback anchors? So it was a little bit of a a little bit of an iterative process to make sure the construction staging didn't have any worst case safety factors than the final condition. So, um, so this one design was completed in February of 2020. Pilot inst installation began in July of that year. Um, tieback anchors in August of 2020. So this was, a, this was a site I only got out to once. <coughs> There's something else going on in the summer of 2020 that <laughs> made it difficult to travel. I can't think of what, uh, for whatever reason, I, I was only get, able to get out there once, which was unfortunate because um, there was a lot of cool stuff going on, but I did get to see, uh, see some piles go in and then relied on uh, my other, Team members to relay me information uh, from the field. So, um, not all bad, but unfortunate time. Um, here's again just some just some photos showing <clears throat> showing the working bench that was created. Again, I didn't mention, but part of the part of the process of creating this lower working bench, you can see um, they put the piles in. Um, Ideally, the working grade would have been up here so they could just be right at the elevation where they're going to put the tieback anchors in after the piles are in. But again, analyzing the stability of this landslide to drive a big crane out on it to put in piles, we felt more comfortable lowering that grade a little bit more to make the crane access. Um, just again to take take a little more weight off of that that sliding mass. So then, once the uh, once the piles were installed, then bring starting to bring in that fill to to build back up to install the tiebacks and then to regrade this out. But um, so again, it's just it's just a lot of checking different stages of construction just to make sure we weren't going to get ourselves in trouble. Um, that's all I had. That was, was it. Chad, in the first two cases of crafts that there are you only had lagging for the structability more or less, and no, no lagging or paneling between the soldiers in the deeper failure zones. With the uh, min dot review, and I'm sure the CM with their morning has a pretty clear review of probably the university of the dormitory. Any issues or any concerns with how you analyze soil bridging or arching between soldiers, especially on an eight foot space on one of this off? Um, no, um, you know, and it and it's more, um, it's it's not in in, in the the spacing wasn't controlled so much by the by the above grade portion where where. The lagging has to do its work, but more from what it's doing at the shear plane elevation. Um, but yeah, no, no issues with the with the spacing. 
um, in terms, at least in terms of what you know, reviewers yeah. were concerned with. Yeah. And so, in the last of the dorms, you mentioned how important it was to consider the staging. So, were you monitoring? Did you have a something going on with during construction to give you some more confidence that the staging you were doing was like adequate? Or? Yeah, there there were inclinometers that were being monitored regularly, uh, inclinometers and piezometers. Um, I don't know that there was any kind of optical survey or anything, but we were basically relying on the existing instrumentation that was there. A after the project was done, there was some additional instrumentation put in, but um, but yeah, yeah, that was there was a construction phase monitoring that was done. Yep. I was just slightly interested in how you guys did the design for Toronto Eight, and the fact that it was a MinDOT project. And obviously, you've got a good relationship with Terra because something happened and they called you and you're still working on it right away. But being a MinDOT design project and a slope failure, unforeseen condition, whatever excuse was, was involved, I'm just curious how you guys were able to fully complete the design and just have a MinDOT review versus a MinDOT design. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I, I think it just became kind yeah, of a, your best. <laughs> <laughs> I think it, I think it was, um, you know, it was just made, made a delegated design for, I, I think part of it was because Tara was already on the job doing other stuff. So they had the abilities and the Crews to to just do it. So I think I I don't I, maybe maybe you know how. Well, I know I really don't. I, I have a problem with late, you know, this week. <laughs> just ask what all transpired there. But no, it probably because again it was under construction. This was done. It like came up to be a surprise, whatever. But then there is no. There's not. Um, a lot of internal did that capacity to do something. So it's going to just be um, with the contractor that's there. And then um, how do we get this done? And it, I can see how it would, it would be kind of constrained to who the contractor, and then they call you, and it just kind of happens because there's just not, there's just not time to go through some months long process of anything other than that. Yeah, and it's and we've been involved with other emergency slope stabilization projects for on MinDOT projects. So working for the contractor, so it it happens, and I don't know how I don't know what how. And again, I don't really. I, I will. I, I will try to find out more about these events. But I, I, I generally, I think it's that's just you know, once you know we do all you know you just imagine the kind of stuff that happens on the, on the scoping design side. But once a contract has been issued. Then it, it's in a different silo in Minda construction. And then their job is to get this thing built. Because the road's closed and they yes. to get it back. And so then it's just like, get it done. Got it. Cool. I guess the one question I noticed power stabilization is still being used. Factor CT 1.2 for drain residual strength. Um, so which 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 one of the cases they usually control in your long-term design? Um yeah, so the the yeah, the residual strength elevated pore pressures were always the <laughs> controlling uh, controlling factor, but um we we'd still check. Right, check other other scenarios, but like in the case of the the first one, CN Steelton, the required safety factors and the required conditions that had to be analyzed were specified in the contract document. So we were we were just kind of checking boxes. But, 
I was going to piggyback off that um, previous line of questions. So you you were working on behalf of the contractor, not on behalf of MnDOT. So when stuff hit the fan, the contractor called you first, and that's how you guys got the job. It's not MnDOT pick up the phone and call engineering partners. Correct. Yep. Contractor contractor called us. Okay. I, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming MnDOT called contractor first and said, "Hey, figure out how to fix this," and then they called us. I, I don't. I'm. Well, again, I should know. I should, maybe I should know more about again looking for a business. <laughs> but I, I do think basically what I attempted to say earlier is that it's inside of the net, there's the there really is a, a planning silo, the sort of scoping engineering silo, and then a construction silo. And so it moves through these processes. I mean, if, if planning takes 10, 10 years, then design takes two or five, and then construction takes one or two. <laughs> but once it moves into construction, then 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 it's like a try to you know get it done. And it's on the, the contractor, then they have something happens during construction. Now, of course, we well, you know, we're not you know, it's not on their contract, but they, they're gonna come to us, I, I believe. Like it was kind of being described here. Contractor is on the job. It's their, it's their job. It's kind of been set in there. We, we, we kind of just hand it off to them. And then they, if something goes wrong, which again, it's not their fault, but then they, they are proposing solutions. But then we get involved with review. So it is driven by the, the contractor on the site. And they're the ones in the position to, to propose certain possibilities. But, but the person communicating with, with whoever had been there. Yep. But they're going to, then if that all makes sense, then it's going to just happen. Sure. So well, the, the point to any of this sort of is that, to me, the point would be that we could potentially have, um, well, it depends on how, how much this was, it was an unanticipated emergency that could not have been anticipated versus, well, should we have planned, should we have done something for action? That, that's what, that's a, it's a, it's a question. <laughs> sure. we, we know the St. Croix, we know this is a terrible place. Uh, <laughs> did we kind of like hope for the best or what? Yeah. Because if we had, if we had been, well, again, I shouldn't think I'd be more, saying more than I should, but if the, we're, it's a big deal whether the department, um, how we look at these risks. And this is an ongoing conversation too. And you guys, this group is, you know, should be engaged in this. We should. I would appreciate that because there's only a handful of geotechs that have been done, and that. Well, now I'm saying more than I should for sure. But that <laughs> it would be nice. I, it would be very nice if somehow this group had. Had one one hundredth of the of the of the ability to influence MnDOT as the asphalt industry, and so that's just a fact. And so, if if, if this group and others could like do anything <laughs> that would get that department to think about things like this, because these things cost a fortune when they go wrong. So anyway, I'll, I'll, or anyway, I, I would I would as a geotech, this would be an incredibly useful thing. If, but it's not happening now because you only got the only people with big money are the concrete industry and the asphalt industry. And the geotechs don't tend to have the kind of money that it takes to, to, to drive policy. <laughs> so, <right>. sorry. <laughs> right. <laughs> cool. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you. All right. Well, I guess just one, I admit that it's, it's been a long day for me and I should have thanked our past president, Craig over there for serving us in last year and also Jill sitting there for helping us in the last two years. And uh, it was a pandemic COVID time and it was a little hard to thank. Um, and uh, we do have seven members join us online today and also thank them for being here. Uh, the recording will be updated 
will be uploaded and uh, to our YouTube channel. If you do not know that one, follow our website and we have that one for you to follow. PDH is in the back on your way out. You can grab one or there's another door here. It's a shortcut to the parking lot. And um, the last thing is our next meeting will be on October, no, November 9th. In person will be the same room here and Braun will be presenting on that one. Um, and uh, again, thank you so much for coming in. Uh, it's good to see you guys all. And um, did I miss anything? Geotech conference. Okay. Oh, one thing about the Geotech conference was the next year Geotech conference 71st will be February 23rd and 24th. So just keep an eye on the emails and we will call for Australia already out. I think that was already done and uh, Please. Yep, that was completed. Yep. Okay, Brian is the chair, training committee chair. So if you have any questions, reach out to him. Um, you guys also hey, looking for? Brian. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone call your friends and ask him. Ask him, please do. Uh, please do a short course on Thursday because we had both of our short courses back out. <laughs> and I tasked our last home. So everyone call your friends and I task. <laughs> Chris is going to volunteer for him. <laughs> Okay, cool. Um, if anybody wants for the sponsorship, plenty of space. We'll have them on both. Send emails to any of the officers about getting on that list to start advertising your company for next month. And for the rest of the year, it's mm -hmm. totally gonna be keeping up with the Joneses. Looks to be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> good for the year. Right? It's good for the year. It's good for the year. Yeah. By a show of hands, who likes the new space? Full time bartender. All right, we still have one piece of cookies there in the back, and so we will take us. You know, thank you so much. Yeah. 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 Yeah.